Good morning. This is Billy Robinson with the Perry Plains Church of Christ, and I'd like to welcome you to our Bible study for March the 7th, 2021. My intent over the next several weeks is to embark on a study on the book of First Peter. John Vincent stated, We are pilgrims, not settlers. This earth is our inn not our home. Well, Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. The word stranger in this very first verse of this epistle means one who comes from a foreign country into a city or land to reside there by the side of the natives. It means a stranger, a foreigner. In the New Testament, New Testament, in reference to heaven as the native country, one who sojourns on earth. Another definition gives, according to Zondervan Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible, one who stays in a place as a stranger or visitor to describe Christians whose final citizenship is in heaven and who are regarded as temporary dwellers on earth. As you will notice in your study, on some, in some translations, it translates this word strangers as pilgrims. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, this word is also translated pilgrims in this particular verse. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Pilgrims is the same word that's translated strangers in the very first chapter, verse 1. We come to the word strangers in chapter 2, verse 11, and it means dwelling near, neighboring. In the New Testament, a stranger, a foreigner, one who lives in a place without the right of citizenship, one who lives on earth as a stranger, a sojourner on the earth, of Christians whose home is in heaven. You can see there's a lot of similarities between those two words. When Paul wrote his epistle to the Philippians, in chapter 3, verse 20, he says, For our citizenship is in heaven. We sing a song every once in a while. Here we are, but straying pilgrims. Here a path is often dim. But to cheer us on our journey, still we sing this wayside hymn. Here our feet are often weary on the hills that throng our way. Here the tempest darkly gathers, but our hearts within us say. Here our shadowed homes are transient, and we meet the stranger's frown. So we'll sing with the joy while going down into dark's, death's dark billow down. Yonder, over the rolling river, where the shining mansions rise, soon will be our home forever, and the smile of the blessed giver gladden all our longing eyes. This is not our home here on earth. We are but straying pilgrims, strangers in a foreign land. Our citizenship is in heaven. And as we are strangers in this world, what Peter stresses to these Christians that are hope in a world not ours is what he's trying to give to us, that we have this hope in this world that we do not belong. Our home is in heaven where we belong. Notice First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Begotten us again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And First Peter 1, 13 says, Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 1, verse 21 that our faith and hope might be in God. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, 
We need to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh us of the reason of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. We do not have time to go back and read all of these verses, sharing with us the persecution, the suffering that these Christians were going through in their lives. But one of the things that we see is that Peter realizes by inspiration what these Christians needed in their lives. And the very first thing as we study chapter one is that they need to be reminded of their salvation. So in our lesson today, we're going to focus on seven causes. I'm going to insert an eighth cause that we see in chapter one, but seven causes of our salvation. The very first cause of our salvation is God. And this is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his, God's abundant mercy, hath begotten us again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Looking back at verse 2, Peter states, we are the elect, the chosen by God, according to the Father's knowledge. Towards the end of the chapter, in verse 21, Peter states, who through him, Jesus, we are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that our faith and hope will rest in God. Peter also states that mercy is a cause of our salvation. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it states, Blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, Wherefore, gird up your loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The NAS says, therefore, gird up your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Another says, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Another says, put all your hope in the grace brought to you by the revelation of Jesus Christ. To admit that we are saved by grace, that we are saved by mercy, is to say that we do not deserve salvation. And the reason we do not deserve it is because, personally, I have sinned, and I continue to sin. And I admit that I fall short of the glory of God. I fall short of what God expects me to be. But guess what? We all have. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For we all have sinned. Romans 3.10. There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.9 and 10 tells us that all of us, all of us are guilty of sin. So, firstly, Paul, I'm sorry, Peter states that God is the cause of our salvation. Secondly, grace or mercy is the cause of our salvation. But thirdly, Peter says that Jesus Christ is a cause of our salvation. In chapter 1, verse 2 of 1 Peter, Peter said, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Notice what he says. Sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 3. 
We've been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How can we be saved if it was not for Jesus? How could we be saved without God? How could we be saved without God's grace and his mercy? They all go hand in hand together. Later in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, he says, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake. Notice. Jesus was manifested for whose sake? My sake, your sake, mankind's sake. That's why he came to earth. That's why he endured what he endured facing the cross, his death, and so forth. In chapter 1, verse 21, who through him that we are believers in God. It's through Jesus Christ that we become believers in God that raised him from the dead, gave him glory so that your faith and hope might be in God. There's no doubt. Without Jesus Christ, there is no salvation from sins. There is no doubt. Without God's mercy and grace, there is no salvation of sins from sins. There is no doubt that without God, there is no salvation from our sins. The fourth cause of our salvation is the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ. Not the blood of just anyone or anything. For in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, it states, It is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. It was not possible that through all the sacrifices under the old covenant, that all the blood that was shed by all of these animals could put one sin into remission. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 states, it was the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice the beautiful picture of salvation found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and verse 19. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Did you realize that salvation is pictured here as being ransomed? In other words, when we are in sin, we are in bondage. We are enslaved to sin and that we need to be purchased from slavery, and the price that was paid for our freedom is the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, salvation is found in his blood, not in all the animals that were sacrificed under the old law, the old covenant, the Old Testament, not by the blood that any other man has shed, but it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. Did you realize another cause of our salvation is the Holy Spirit? According to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, Christians have sanctification of the Spirit. If you're not aware in our religious world today the holy spirit receives credit for many things that he has not done for us there are so many false teachings and we need to be very careful and not make that mistake but yet at the same time 
we need to give credit to him for what he has done for us. We need to attribute to him what he has done in our part of salvation. In John chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Verily, verily, Jesus said, I say unto you, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, these are the words of Jesus. Notice the words of the inspired writer, the Apostle Paul, in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. As he writes to Titus, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The NAS says he saved us not on the basis of deeds or works that we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Ghost. Here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, salvation is pictured as being sanctified or set apart for God's purposes. So yes, the Holy Spirit plays a big part in our salvation. If it was not for him, we would not be able to be sanctified, set apart for God's work. Think about this. In addition to all of these things, the word of God is a cause of salvation. Notice 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere love of the brethren, love one another earnestly from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls. But the word of the Lord abides forever. That word is the good news which was preached to you. Notice how the word is described. It is described as the truth. Imperishable. In other words, it's living and abiding forever. It is of God. It is good news and it is be it was being preached and it is continuing to be preached today now if you look back at verse 23 the word of god is the means by which we are born again men and women today as well as the ones to whom peter was writing cannot and i emphasize cannot be saved apart from the word of God. For else, how could a man know what to do to be saved if it was not for the word? The word, the truth, that which is imperishable, living and abiding forever, the truth that is of God, the gospel, the good news that is to be proclaimed. Seventhly, pick. Peter pictures himself as a cause of his salvation. Notice verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. What did this imply to his readers? They themselves had something to do with their salvation. Salvation is undoubtedly by grace. It is not by merit. It is a work of God, not a production of man. Yet, there is some sense in which a man brings about or causes his own salvation, in which he can be said to save himself. We have scripture. That backs that up. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37. When the Jews on the day of Pentecost heard the message that Peter proclaimed unto them, 
the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, and how they were guilty of crucifying the Son of God. It says, They were pricked in their hearts, and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They realized that they needed to do something. This is not the only time in the book of Acts the question was asked, What will you have me to do? In Acts chapter 2, verse 40, Peter continued and stated to the multitudes that they needed to save themselves from this untoward generation. He pleaded with them to save themselves from this corrupt generation. Yes, there is something that we must do to be saved, to save ourselves. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, Paul wrote to this young man, Timothy, Take heed unto thyself, and unto the doctrine. Is doctrine important? Count on it. What do he say? Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Not any doctrine, the doctrine. The faith that's been once and delivered, as we see in Jude, verse 3. It says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing so, thou shalt say both thyself and them that hear thee. He says, you need to be very careful, Timothy, to continue in the doctrine, the faith, the truth, the gospel, the words of Jesus, the words of God. For when you continue in them, you will save yourself and you will save those that you teach, those that will hear you. So it is not surprising Peter brings out the idea that obedience is a cause of salvation. And this is the eighth cause of salvation that we have observed. The readers to whom Peter was writing had purified their souls by what? Their obedience to the truth in obeying the truth. How does a man play a role in his salvation? By obeying the truth. Obeying the truth would be the same as obeying Jesus Christ, being obedient unto Jesus, being obedient unto his words, being obedient unto the words of God. They're all of the same. These commands, to obey the truth would include the following. To believe in Jesus Christ, John 8, 24. Unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. We need to repent of our sins, which would be involved in obeying the truth. God commendeth all men everywhere to repent, Acts 17, verse 30. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2, 37, verse 38. He says, the first thing he says is repent. We'll look at the second thing in a minute. First thing he says is to repent. Repent or perish, Luke 13, 3. Another command that would be involved in obeying the truth would that we need to confess our faith before men. Confess Jesus before others. If we'll confess Jesus before others, he'll confess us before his Father, our Father in heaven. And obedience to the truth would include to be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Acts 2.38, verse 37, you remember, what, many brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38, repent. And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. First Peter chapter 3, verse 21 states, and I've heard people say that baptism does not save. 
1 Peter 3.21, Peter, by inspiration, says it did. It says, The like figure were unto even baptism doth also now save us. When we are obedient unto the truth, we say yes to the grace of God. We're accepting the free gift of salvation. But notice in this first salvation is pictured as being purified. Our souls are purified. Why do they need to be purified? Because they have been darkened, they have been blackened, they have been dirtied by sins that we have committed in life. These sins have separated us from God. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and verse 2. In addition, salvation is pictured as being born again. Sin kills us spiritually. Sin kills the soul spiritually. Salvation brings the sinner who was dead in trespasses and sins back to life again. Ephesians chapter 2 states, And you hath he quickened, and you hath he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. In verse 5 of Ephesians chapter 2, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, hath made us alive together with Jesus Christ. By grace, ye are saved. The picture we have of salvation in 1 Peter chapter 1 includes being chosen, ransomed, sanctified, purified, born again. It is said to be the cause by God, by mercy, by Jesus Christ, by the blood, the blood of Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God, by man himself, and by obedience unto the truth. Remember what these Christians were going through in their lives. They were suffering. They had a lot of heartaches. They were going to experience more persecution just for being a child of God. They needed to be reminded of their salvation and the causes of their salvation. That's what Peter tells me as we look and read and study these verses. Life is hard and life is difficult, but we need to remember that when we've been saved and sanctified and purified and ransomed and chosen and destined and born again, we need to be reminded of the causes of our salvation. Instead of looking for one cause of salvation and rejecting all others, we need to try to see the plan of salvation as a whole and discover what part each cause plays in producing our redemption. To say that we're saved by the word of God alone is not truth. To say that we are saved by the blood of Christ alone is not truth, as Peter has brought out in chapter 1. Notice how all of these things that we've studied today fit in together very tightly as an elegant and orderly scheme. God, cause one, by his mercy or grace, cause two, has chosen us or predestined us to be saved. Because of his mercy, God sent Christ, cause three, to be our savior. Christ save us by his blood, cause four, which has ransomed or redeemed us from the bondage of sin. Christ sent the Holy Spirit, cause five. And the Holy Spirit saves us through the word, cause six, which he has inspired. And it is through the word that we are sanctified. The word is given to man, cause seven, to be the immediate means of man's salvation. Man responds to the word and so saves himself by his obedience to that word. Then man 
is purified. And the result of the whole plan is that we are born again. One plays checkers or chess. He sometimes plays, turns to his opponent and says, it is your move. It is your turn to move. That is what God is now saying to us. I've given you the opportunity to be saved. Christ has died to save you. The Holy Spirit has made known to you what you have to do to be saved. Now, Billy, it is your move. And if you're listening this morning, he's saying, now, it's your move. It's time for you to do something about your relationship with God. I hope that you will respond to the gracious invitation of God by coming to Jesus Christ in obedience as we have observed in our lesson today. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 22 through 24, I'd like to read these verses as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper for the ones that are at home and are unable to assemble with God's family today. Peter wrote, Jesus committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled the insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he trusted himself to him who judges justly. Would you bow with me as we partake? Have a prayer and prior to partaking of the bread. Father, as Jesus stated, take eat. This is my body. We reflect upon what he went through in his body, what he went through in his spirit, what he went through, those trials, the mocking, the sufferings, the thorns that were pressed down upon his head, the scourgings, the spitting, I cannot comprehend the pain of those nails going through his feet and hands and then hanging there on that cross. But we praise you. We thank you for that wonderful scheme of redemption, for his willingness to do what he did for us. And we want to thank you for this bread. And it is through your son, Jesus Christ, that I pray. Amen. Would you bow with me again as we give thanks for the cup? Our Father, as we, our minds reflect back to the time of that Passover meal, that last supper that Jesus had with his disciples, we know that after he took the bread and passed it, he took the cup and he told them that this was the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. We're grateful for his blood that was shed on the cross. We know that without the shedding of his blood, we would not be able to have a right relationship with you. We would not be able to have forgiveness of sins. Thank you for him. Thank you for that blood that was shed. Thank you for this cup. And as we partake of it, I pray that we partake of it in a right manner, in a right attitude towards you 
and towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. And it is through Jesus we pray. And amen. Thank you for allowing me into your home this way through the internet to share a message from you that it was so important to these Christians to whom Peter was writing, and it is so important to us today. We need to realize the seven causes of salvation, yea, the eighth cause of salvation, which is obedience as we have studied in 1 Peter chapter 1 today. Thank you again for listening. And this week, as you meditate and think about these words that Peter wrote, continue to study chapter 1, for we will return, Lord willing, next Sunday, the next Lord's Day, and look at another lesson from this particular chapter. Let's continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Thank you.